and we have assembled and arrayed here a formidable amount of expertise and talent. So we will invite people to slightly take off their organizational hats and share perspectives and sort of fresh thinking. The second, we want to make it a bit interactive, a bit innovative, to try and um, introduce some creative new ideas and then look at how we bring those together into a more coherent way and be a little bit propositional. Thirdly, we're going to have some sessions exploring the country experiences and some of the latest research, combining that building to some practical policy proposals, something that we can take away and really think that we can still influence the, if not the first draft, then the second draft of the outcome document. And we have many of the people in the room actually today who are key protagonists and stakeholders in actually crafting, drafting, negotiating that, that deal, that consensus. So we're really excited about that. The way we will proceed over the next couple of days is um, to start with, after the Honourable Minister has given his remarks, there will be um, an update on where we are with the state of the process. What are some of the policy dynamics? What are some of the open questions? Then we'll look at some of the challenges that this sort form of financing, international public finance, needs to grapple with and build into the country perspective on that. Tomorrow we're going to turn for what this means in the process side, there'll be some brainstorming sessions, there'll be some more interactive work, and we'll bring it together with the help from some of you in a concluding panel that will help us really be clear of what our, all our sort of back-to-office reports are when we leave and what the clear proposition's emerging. So that's the structure, the form, the objectives. Ambitious, but we still think tractable and a, and a good way to spend two days. A couple of little pieces of housekeeping before I move on, if, if you will uh, bear with me. First of all, we have a, a couple of lunchtime sessions where we'll have some different perspective on different financing. I've just been asked for the catering purposes. If you could just raise a hand if you're planning to come along to some of the lunchtime sessions. I hope that's a yes. I'm going to raise mine enthusiastically in the hope that some of you do. That, that's great. So I think the organizers can take note. Secondly, I would invite you to look at some of the um, materials outside our partners development initiatives to set up a data hub. Um, that's, uh, you'll be able to explore that, find out more. There are some banners and screens around dotted around the room. And thirdly, for those participating, the country participants participating in the role plays, there'll be a meeting in one of the side rooms at 11.30, so please do join Matthew Martin from Development Finance Initiatives for that. Well, finally, um, it's of course um, no coincidence that we are um, hosting this conference in Ghana, and we feel privileged and delighted that, the, that ASSET and the government have invited us to do so. This is um, significant, a country that has achieved a tremendous amount over the past couple of decades, recently achieved middle income status, and of its own volition and with the encouragement of um, other international actors, has been really exploring and experimenting with a financing agenda beyond aid, looking at the role and the contribution of other financing sources but still critically looking at the residual and important contribution of international public finance. So we really hope with so many esteemed and distinguished guests from Ghana here as well, we'll be able to learn a lot from that particular experience. So on that note, I'm privileged, I'm delighted to welcome Ghana's Minister of Finance, the Honorable Sabturka, to officially open this conference to share a few of reflections with you. Thank you so much, Honorable Minister. Thank you very much, uh, <coughs> Mr. Chairman and Moderator. Um, colleague ministers, I see a few from Ghana and from outside the country. I recognize <coughs> a West African colleague in our presence, uh, Mr. Kamara. Heads of private and public sector institutions who are joining us here. Our sponsors, ODI, Asset UNDP, Brookings, Cadbury, I hope I have not left you know, any out, forgive me <coughs> if I have. Our development partners and representatives from the research and academic worlds, uh, distinguished speakers and invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, friends from Namibia. It's my distinct honor and privilege to welcome all of you to Ghana and this unique gathering. A gathering which brings together key representatives from the UN, IMF, and other institutions, development agencies, as I've mentioned, to 
a forum, which as we've just been told is a preparatory one, towards a very important objective <coughs> and a global agenda. It is a unique opportunity to share experiences in best practice, principles, and on how international public finance can contribute to accelerating progress in development. We will make specific contributions to financing for development, to the financing and development process, and attempt to influence decision makers ahead of the Addis Ababa Conference on Financing for Development in July 2015. <coughs> Global growth remains in low gear and downside risk persists in both private and public sectors in many economies. The advanced economies are recovering at a rather low pace, mostly hindered by constraints on both the demand and supply sides. There are several paradoxes. Emerging markets are still in the lead, although they are also slowing down from elevated levels in recent years in some cases to avoid and alter the direction of their development, such as moving away from export-led, vigorous export-led growth as you know, the developed economy slow and looking internally into domestic demand. A few sources of risk to growth and financial stability in several of these economies is attributed to the unwinding or tapering of the unconventional monetary policies in some advanced countries, which provide opportunities, but challenges as well, even as the use of these non-conventional uh, policies, uh, monetary policies are put in gear in other advanced economies and regions, such as the EU. <coughs> in the face of these global developments, some developing countries, especially African countries are also experiencing a paradigm shift. They are focusing on improving their infrastructure and managing their natural resource wealth to achieve a broad-based and inclusive growth. These economies are also seeking to strengthen the implementation of structural reforms in order to maintain annual average growth rates around the 5% you know, mark that they have achieved in the last few years, even while the global financial crisis you know, was hitting other regions of the world. The process for inclusive growth also involves simultaneous improvements in the MDG goals, especially the quest to improve human capital through health education training to significantly reduce poverty in the short and medium term. The current development finance paradigm for developing countries emphasizes official development assistance and attempts in many instances to distinguish it from other types of financial relationships, especially those that are market-based. It tends, therefore, to separate the exposure you know, to markets particularly those markets that come with opportunities but also very hard you know, commercial terms, such as the foray by some countries into the capital, global capital markets, you know, which has received both commendation and in some cases some you know, cynicism about the ability of these countries to handle such a phenomenon. South-South compression principles focus on a package of mutual interests that deliberately, therefore, mixes various financing options to blur the distinctions of ODA and commercial opportunities, such commercial opportunities. It is typically characterized by ODA and a mix of commercial products to constitute so-called pre preferential windows for borrowing for developing countries and in many cases, the long-term finance that is provided by multilateral institutions. 
the phenomenon raises interesting issues in the context of the paradigm shifts that are occurring in financing the future. <laughs> in addition to securing bilateral and multilateral funding, there will be the need, therefore, to identify alternative and innovative sources of funding as we move into the future. In this regard, emerging powers are attempting to be a significant source of new financing in the development process. For example, we have BNDS, you know, of Brazil, uh, China, Exim, and CDB, for example, the Exims in Korea, Turkey, and other countries, African Development Bank, Asian Development Bank, and others which have been there coming up with new tools such as the Africa 50 Fund, you know, which does not rely on the sovereign countries and, you know, the contributing partners to, say, the African Development Bank, but it is uh, designed to be market-focused. These emerging powers will generally provide their resources as part of integrated packages involving trade, investment, and other commercial ventures, as many countries in Africa are beginning to realize. Market mechanisms and private sector contributions also provide significant sources of funding, and this is often overlooked. I often cite the example of Ghana, you know, where the investments in the petrochemical you know, in the petroleum and oil sectors, with the exception of whatever state involvement may have gone into our Ghana National Petroleum Corporation, is fully funded by the private sector. There has not been a single instance of a sovereign, you know, guarantee issued, you know, to any of the institutions that are exploring, you know, on our shores and onshore that are involved in major developments, not just in Ghana, but as we experience in others. So I would ask you to spare a thought for this equity financing and the sourcing of the markets, albeit by you know, foreign firms, which may already have credentials for the capital markets, but the flow is coming into you know, our countries. This is definitely a source of financing. It's difficult to imagine how the government of Ghana, for example, could have financed the Jubilee field and the Sankofa field, you know, which we know is led by E and I Vitor, you know, global names. Uh, we do have other names like Tulo Cosmos, you know, and the rest. The future envisaged for the next generation is one that must be sustainable, inclusive, and innovative and makes use of alternative sources of financing. It must prepare some of uh, Africa rising countries to manage the risk posed by the capital markets in particular. In this regard, capital markets play an important role by ensuring that growth is not about maximization, but optimization of opportunities in the economy. It is worthy of note that the capital markets as part of the financial system is critical to the economic development of a rising Africa, even as we note that the opportunities also come with the slowing of demand, you know, for international finance capital in the advanced economies, and therefore the terms on which some of this financing is secured could definitely change. There are also risks which I would return to you know, in a short while. Many African economies did relatively well during the global financial crisis, which threatened European and US economies in particular. According to the IMS January 2015 World Economic Outlook, growth in Sub-Saharan Africa remained robust, even in 2014 at 4.8% and is expected to accelerate in 2015 and beyond. Yet, the hard reality is that they can, these countries can continue to be brought to their knees, brutally bowed by the same exposure, you know, to the fall in advanced economies, demand for commodity prices and several economic volatilities as Ghana has experienced recently with respect to gold, cocoa and crude oil, you know, prices. Therefore, 
it is important even as we look into the financing options to also address the need to the need to address volatilities in order that we can manage you know these new flows so they do not become a difficulty for many economies the Ghanaian economy has been stable over three decades and is expanding combining improvements in macroeconomic management progress in social intervention and strong export growth in the last decade Economic growth has pushed Ghana into the lower middle income bracket and has accelerated poverty reduction. Consistent economic growth since 2000 has nearly cut poverty levels in half as of 2006 using 1990 as the base. Ghana is consequently on track and has met her MDG targets and goals. And yet still, Ghana is an economy that in recent times has been affected you know, by the very volatilities which I mentioned, particularly characterized in the last two years. In spite of this recent strong growth, therefore, the Ghanaian economy, as noticed, has been contending with challenges. Some of them are policy-based, such as the management of our wages and subsidy, which thankfully we are correcting, and others are due to external shocks, as I just, you know, mentioned. It has affected, in one major respect, the ability of the country to continue borrowing without its debt you know, rising if you take a measure like the debt to GDP ratio. Even though we have slowed down in borrowing for infrastructure development, consequent to the borrowing space that was provided by HIPIC, the slowdown in growth from about 8% average to 45 has also taught us a very important lesson, especially since we are also rated in the global financial markets, you know, that the change in the denominator, GDP, can affect, you know, your indicators, you know, for rating on the market, and it's therefore important for countries that are exposed to the markets to have a medium-term perspective, you know, of what, you know, they are doing. Since the country attained its middle income status, access to concessional financing has decreased significantly. And this is a point which, for the countries, you know, which are emerging or are in the bracket of Africa rising, it is an important point to make. The loss of grants and concessional financing is very important, which means, again, buttresses the need for alternative sources of financing, you know, for development. Inflows from our development partners are highly volatile, showing a cyclical effect, especially in election years when DPs adopt a wait and see approach, or such as when they are waiting for an IMF program as you know, we are experiencing in Ghana today. These developments together with government's quest to sustain its national economic policy objectives as contained in Ghana's shared growth and development agenda our medium-term plan are compelling us to diversify our sources of financing and also improve on its delivery. But it is also about the quality of borrowing, and I'll return to this in a short while. <coughs> Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, the case of Ghana, which is a country in transition and experiencing a few paradoxes are worth noting. The country is still developing and poor in many respects, and yet it is classified as a lower middle income country, and therefore gradually losing its access to concessional financing. <coughs> it is a country that has huge opportunities in an expanding services, with an expanding services sector a resuscitation of agriculture, the advent of modest crude oil exports, and use of gas to improve the power sector. Yet, Ghana is learning the hard way that it has to diversify and add value rapidly to its output to avoid being brought to its knees by the very risk that it used to experience, which is nothing more than you know, the volatilities in commodity, you know, pricing. 
of relevance to our gathering here is Ghana's healthy exposure to a capital market, which I mentioned. We have done two sovereign bonds in two years, and we are preparing for a third one this year. We return to this also. But this comes with an intense focus on its short-term challenges, a factor that you learn with the capital markets can lead to downgrades, a very harsh commentary on your performance, and which sometimes completely ignores your medium-term prospects. In an attempt to resolve its challenges through the very orthodox means which we are going through, and despite its lower middle income status, which is what is different about the program of adjustment that Ghana is going through today, the country must still follow the dictates that limits non-concessional borrowing, even though it has an exposure to the healthy exposure to the capital markets, as I said, and which even dares to say, you must use the very dwindling grants and concessional financing for commercial projects. This is a major paradox. The challenges that the so-called lions face in an emerging Africa and elsewhere is the lack of a development model or a developmental model for so-called emerging countries in transition. It appears that the development finance institutions in particular have not devised a package from the experiences of the Asian Tigers or the EU assistance to Eastern European countries, neither have they developed any package from the experience of Middle Eastern sovereign wealth, you know, approach to development to guide our transition to a middle income country status. <coughs> this is an issue which I believe is key for our agenda. The packaging of a mix of financial products, developmental models, and others that build on the experiences of some of the countries that have tried this path already in order that the countries that are going through a similar transition can you know, learn to avoid you know, various pitfalls. What have we been doing? For us in Ghana, we have been learning from the experience of the BRICS and the others which I have mentioned. So we are learning to separate concessional financing and grants from commercial borrowing in order to channel commercial concessional financing and grants to social infrastructure and directing your commercial borrowing to projects that can pay for the facility rather than rely on the taxpayer to pay and therefore have a high exposure to what may be called pure public debt. <coughs> we are learning that when you borrow for a commercial project and the source of financing is for only 85% of the project and you have to provide your 15%, you do not go to the treasury market for a 90 day bill to finance your 15%. It's a complete mismatch of tenor and yet grants will not give you that 15%. This is one context in which a healthy approach to long term finance from the capital markets for 10 to 15 years can match tenor with tenor. Because after all, the reason you go for a 15 or I dare say 25 year World Bank IMF for a developing, sorry, an emerging lower middle income country like Ghana, or you do go for even a KFW 40 year facility, it's because you want to spread yourself out 
you know, in the repayment. We are also learning that if you borrow for commercial projects, particularly for state-owned enterprises, you must compel them to manage those projects well in order, the in order that the proceeds from those projects build the toll roads, harbor projects, you know, dams or whatever, can help pay for the facility rather than put it on the taxpayer. We are have learning to harness the resources from oil in order that it does not become a curse, rather a blessing to channel into sovereign wealth funds or an infrastructure fund, that would be the one we leverage for borrowing from the capital markets and not depend on public servants who have no exposure or expertise in capital market borrowing or the management of projects you know, to pay for such loans. We have established from those same funds a stabilization fund which in three years has accumulated nearly 600 million US dollars and on which we are going to be depending this year to help manage the shortfall in revenue from the fall in crude oil prices. Taking even half of that is 300 million dollars or a thousand or 1.5 billion Ghana roughly Ghana cities which is roughly equivalent to nearly one-tenth of the revenue which our tax institutions generated in the last two years. We have to learn, given these exposures, to use simple tools. We don't talk about complex ones that would enhance the risk in the form of hedges, swaps, and others to manage some of our volatilities, particularly the change in commodity prices. And we are moving from an unfettered use of sovereign guarantees for every loan that we take. We are working with the World Bank and African Development Bank, whom has been commended, towards using partial risk guarantees, which recognizes that there is sovereign risk, but does not also assume full private sector risk you know, when we attract these investments. And even though it involves the use of some of Ghana's, you know, IDA, dwindling IDA resources, it is worth, you know, the investment in attracting nearly, you know, 700 million of investments and billions of returns over the years from our gas fields. There are other initiatives such as the attempt to establish an Asian bank that would make our economies a bit more export oriented and not open as to the other Asian institutions which I have mentioned, which after all are doing nothing more than promoting exports, which we take in as imports, you know, or loans. Ghana has a highly earmarked budget that channels funds towards education, we call it the GET Fund, health, we call it the NHIL, and rural development, we call it the District Assemblies Common Fund. It poses challenges in its own, but we must see this earmarking also as the source of our progress in the Millennium Development Goals or social intervention. And it's very important, therefore, to manage these domestic resources together with domestic resource mobilization in a very healthy, you know, manner. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, in 2013 and 2015, government tapped the euro bond market, as I said, and we will be as using some of these, you know, sources, but carefully, you know, in order that, as I said, we can use it to restructure our short-term debt, counterpart funding, and financing of capital expenditure. This is important because often the impression is given that when you go to the euro bond market, everything is new capital that adds to your debt. 
our experience is that many countries can use it to also uh, refinance. I mentioned the 90 day you know, bills that we have used in the past, the three year bonds that we have used in the past, which are putting pressures on interest rates and crowding out the private sector by substituting the long term finance you know, with you know, these, um, for these funds in order that you can stretch yourself out in terms of repayment, particularly for capital projects. But we have also learned that when you go to the capital markets and you see 10 years out, it may be a long time. Our first bond issued in 2007 is due in 2017, which is just two years away, with virtually no plan you know, for amortizing them, and therefore we have had to refinance it. As a result of which, we are also establishing a sinking fund this time, as colleague African countries from Gabon to Cameroon do when they issue their sovereign bonds. bonds. There are PPP and other options, which I believe you know, are also healthy alternatives to financing. What I have done, I would hope, is to avert your attention to the importance of continuing with ODI long-term financing because we remain a developing country, particularly for the countries that are in transition. But at the same time, also because of this transition, for some African countries, if they are to realize their goal, would also mean that they would have to have an exposure to commercial borrowing. And indeed, if you take the transition for countries like Ghana, if they were to cement their median income countries, that means that even for the international finance institutions, Ghana will be moving from IDA to an IBRD hybrid and to a full IBRD, which itself is market oriented and similar with African Development Bank. So what I've done is to try and let you see a broad spectrum. As we often say, Africa and many developing countries are 50 countries, not one continent. We are one continent, but not one country, rather. And there are diversities. And in your thinking, I would hope there would be this diversity you know, of thinking. I have not touched on environmental funds. I have not touched on major initiatives such as the one launched by the IMF and World Bank for fragile countries, countries in conflict and the rest. And so there is a diversity of resources that are there. What I'm trying to also say is not to pass judgment on our ability to enter the commercial you know, market. What is required of a forum like this is to give direction as to how to protect countries and how to enable them minimize the risk to these new opportunities. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you happy you know, deliberations. Unfortunately, I have other commitments I would have wished to. I had planned to stay for a while, but unfortunately, I have to leave for a meeting, and I hope that you would excuse me. Once again, you are welcome to Ghana, and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Honourable Minister, for, for um, giving us such a wide-ranging speech covering all the, you know, the many, many different issues on the financing side. Um, we look forward to picking up many and many of the points that you, you've raised in our deliberations over the next couple of days, and delighted that you've uh, hosted us here for the next, next two days. Thank you. Without further ado, may I invite the panellists for the first session um, to come up, please, up to, to the front, and we'll, we'll, get, we'll get going. Um, could I also say that we are um, translating, we have interpretation from English into French. If anyone does require a headset, please just raise your hand and we'll make sure that that comes to you. Thank you very much, Minister. So. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. We're now going to move um, seamlessly into the first session, which we're describing as a sort of political style cafe, where we're going to try and explore some of the um, issues that were just introduced by the Minister of Finance, but also hear a little bit more about some of the liberations on the FFD process. Just in terms of time, we'll probably um, take the opportunity to take about an hour and 15 minutes or so now to give all the speakers an, an opportunity to, um, to share their perspectives before, before coffee. So we have um, two objectives for this, this session now, which we'll try and keep as interactive as possible. And there'll be plenty of time to questions. The first is to bring you up to speed on some of the latest developments in the FFD process. We know that the formal negotiations began in January. Um, the first draft of the text is emerging. Um, we want to find out where have we really got to, what agendas are still on the table, what's up for discussion. Um, the panel will help us with that, but I'm sure we'll also be interested to hear perspectives to help them with some of that process as well. And secondly, we'll try and move that a little bit more into shaping the agenda. Um, I would just like to say that we are we have a, a really first-rate panel. It's not exactly as built in the program, but, but, um, but, but no less, less for it. Um, a couple of um, apologies. Um, Mahmoud Moadin from the World Bank, unfortunately, was, was um, detained on other urgent business in, in Washington, wasn't able to join us. And Esteban um, perez Caldente from UN ECLAC, also there were some technical difficulties with the flight, so um, both send their apologies. But I am, however, delighted to welcome um, Dr. Samura Kamara, Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation from the Government of Sierra Leone. Um, Jos Fabik, advisor to Mahmoud Maldin, um, who, as we know, is the World Bank Corporate Secretary and the President's Special Envoy on post-2015. Van Welbekozi, the Executive Director of the African Forum and Network on Debt and Development. Shari Spiegel, Chief of the Policy Analysis and Development Branch of the Financing the Development Office in UNDESA, and Philip Schronrock, who is the director of CEPE, Center for International and Strategic Thinking, um, based in Colombia. So we are in extremely good hands. Um, we look to have um, a sort of vibrant discussion. The way we will run is I propose to um, invite the, um, the panel to offer a few opening remarks. I'm going to ask you if, you, if you may, to try and restrict your comments to no more than five minutes, just so that we've got some time. And we'll, we'll then pose a couple of questions, get a little bit of discussion going between us at the front here, but very quickly um, open this up for comments and questions from the floor. So, um, without further ado, um, Dr. Kamara, if I may um, hand over to you, if you wouldn't mind, to get us going with a few reflections from um, what you think is at stake here and what you think some of the emerging priorities are. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, uh, and, th and thank you for, for having me. Uh, the strategic context, Mr. Chairman, in which we are, is such that uh, this particular year, 2015, is a very critical year for all of us involved in development. Um, of course, there are two important issues. The first is we're trying to define and promote what we define as a new global development paradigm, mm -hmm. um, a post-2015 sustainable development blueprint for everybody, which as of now is defined by 17 um, SDGs with as many as 169 targets. And you're also correct to say that in 2015, we're also trying to define uh, an agreement on climate change. The African Union has a 2063 vision, and certainly almost every region and country in the world has uh, a, a longer term strategic vision. Um, I'm coming from, from a country where these challenges have been compounded by challenges that are emerging in the health, public health sector, where we are faced with a, with a virus that has never been seen in the world, and uh, it's, add, it's going to add more to, to the development challenges that we're already facing. I'm coming from, from a similar engagement which was organized by the Friends of Europe in Brussels, on the 8th of, of, this, of this year. And 
I was on a panel again with participants, including um, the, the new EU commissioner for, for international um, development. There were panelists from OECD, JICA, EIB, and then Eurodac. We tried again, as you mentioned, to share experiences on some of the critical areas which you want us to identify. So these include the continuing role of official development assistance, ODA. Of course, the context is such that ODA budgets are under severe strain, and it's been difficult for many of the countries to meet even the 0.7% of GNI commitments to developing countries. Um, now, the conclusion that even if you have 0.7% fully subscribed to, it will still not be, um, not, not be sufficient, but you will need ODA. We also looked at options for innovative financing, putting the spotlight on public-private partnerships, blended finance, FDI flows, and internal domestic resources. What needs to be done for a more inherent use of home remittances, corporate social responsibility investments, and philanthropy, as well as efforts to recover or eliminate illicit finance and tax havens. At the conference, we also recognize the changing pattern of international aid and investment architecture, the arrival of new development actors, and the growing importance of South-South cooperation and triangular arrangements. In recent years, the aid landscape has been greatly diversified, and we must recognize that. We also must recognize the emergence of sovereign wealth, as my colleague from Ghana just mentioned, sovereign wealth funds, especially in developing countries. This is new to us. Um, we, need, we need this type of uh, engagement. And then we believe there is a relatively lukewarm approach to exploiting the fuller potential or other sources of funding, including carbon credit finance, and certainly for small islands, blue economy resources. And I think we need to, to, to exploit all of that. Now, going forward, Sierra Leone is a post-conflict country. We have had different stages of financing. During the, the, the early years of post-conflict reconstruction, much of our financing was uh, dubbed uh, from grants and highly concessional, simply because we required uh, emergency and humanitarian type of financing. But of course, this was just for uh, health and other post-conflict recovery measures social safety nets, which is still huge in our budget. Where we are now is we're trying to look at the hardware of, of development. Hard infrastructure, roads, energy. These are the key drivers of, 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 of growth. And growth is very fundamental in, in trying to push even poverty reduction. But unfortunately for us, this is why we have very huge uh, financing gaps, because you do not have the resources. Like any other developing country, Sierra Leone cannot go into the international capital market simply because, again, we don't have the stature. Uh, we cannot provide the necessary financial guarantees. We are not rated. I, I envy Ghana, as, as said was speaking, we are not rated in market, but we're trying to have a shadow rating. We believe it will not be below B minus or thereabouts, so that at least that would guide us in trying to prepare ourselves. We're also trying to do a sovereign wealth fund. We have laid the foundation for it. In the event we get resources, additional resources from, from mining as well as from oil exploration, uh, it is very important that we start laying the foundation. We're looking at local content in financing some of our development partners, uh, development challenges, local content from the, 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 the investments. The domestic gener revenue generation capacity is, is very weak. We, there are limitations of which you can use taxation and non-tax uh, revenue sources. Unless the economy picks up, unless it's properly rebooted and it grows, you have very little scope. So for us, as you rightly mentioned, ODA will remain a, a, a very critical uh, a source of funding. But of course, we also realize what we can get from South-South cooperation. And Sierra Leone, like many other countries, are now relying heavily on, on, on the emerging uh, market countries, clearly the BRICS. China in particular, they, are, they have a combination of ODA-type financing as well as grants and, and, and uh, some other concessional, uh, uh, concessional borrowing. 
But the difference is that the concessional borrowing is much lower than, than market rates, but it is higher than um, uh, um, uh, either or ADF uh, type, of, type of borrowing. But the good thing is that there is less uh, bureaucratic uh, uh, process in, in, in trying to, to access that funding. So that what it means that in going forward, we must not only look at financing itself, we must also look at the modalities, the mechanisms by which people, countries can access financing. Some of them, in conditionality, for instance, we have been fighting with conditionality. But I think it's just like the phone, must also rethink uh, the debt sustainability ratios of these countries because unless you have uh, an optimal mix, mix of, of both concessional and non-concessional, it will be difficult for any of these countries to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. And we're turning it on in case it screeches, but we seem to be all right. Thank you so much. Um, um, Minister, I, I think extremely helpful. I think a really nice compliment, actually, to the, the other, your, your fellow minister's um, speech before about talking about the need to diversify across the concessional and non-concessional space, but also um, the importance of the concessional finance and I mean the, the, the really, really sort of significant public health challenges, for example, that you've been facing. But also, I, I, I lo rather like this phrase that as well as the social sector, also moving to the hardware of development and the role of financing in, in that as well. Um, I think we'll come back to this question that's raised again about the nature of concessional borrow borrowing and countries moving from sort of income category transitions and how well served they are by access to that sort of um, semi-concessional finance. Um, if I may, I'm going to sort of proceed. Um, next along the order I've, I've been given. So I might ask um, Jos Fabig um, to come in next, if that's all right. Sorry, I'm just sort of uh, making sure the panelists are awake, but I'm not quite sure uh, who's going next. But they do. And maybe da, da, da. just ask you to give a, um, a sort of a perspective. I mean, sitting from, you know, what's the Washington and the MDB um, perspective on some of this and the deliberations that are going on? Uh, the three king actually really helped us to wake up. So I, I was dozing off. Um, well, thank you for, for having me here. It's a pleasure to come to Ghana. I've worked quite a lot on Africa, but mostly in southern and eastern. So this is uh, my first time in Accra, and I'm quite happy to be here. Uh, I want to apologize again for my, my boss not making it. But that uh, at the table, we were making the joke, given that the I would have drafted his talking points anyway. Now you're getting it straight from the source instead <laughs> of uh, having to hear it from him. Uh, he's also staying actually behind for a very good reason, because the spring meetings coming up in, in, in Washington in, in April will have a heavy focus on financing for development. And at the moment, actually, or in a few hours, the, our board will be meeting to discuss how we will position ourselves at the spring meeting on financing for development. So he stayed behind for a good reason. I will try to lift the curtain a little bit on what type of things we, we, we plan to, to put forward uh, in my little five minutes intervention, or probably is longer. Uh, as every economist can normally make the joke, if the economist has five minutes, he will talk for ten. If in ten, he will talk for twenty, etc., etc. So I, I want to take you through three. Uh, is this still on and off? Is okay. I just wanted to talk to you maybe about three things. One, what's different today compared to uh, say Monterey or the. The, when the Millennium Development Goals were put in place. A little bit about what we as the, the multilateral development banks are trying to put forward for others. And then a little bit of an, uh, a few, hopefully, more concrete issues that the World Bank Group is trying to do to make itself ready to finance and implement the SDGs. Okay, what's different today from, from say, 15 years ago? One, I think, is we need to be honest about the role of ODA, Official Development Assistance. In the early 1990s, or sorry, in the early 2000s, it was about 20% or if not more of the financial flows going into development countries. At the moment, it's probably around 10, if not less than 10%. So developing countries have access to very much a lot of other financial flows. These are remittances. Remittances are about three, four times higher than uh, ODA, and the rest is all for indirect investment or private flows that are flowing in. So the financial landscape has changed a lot for developing countries but not necessarily a lot for low-income countries. Low-income countries still face a heavy difficulty attracting uh, the foreign direct investment type of flows. They still depend, for a large extent, 60 to 70% actually on ODA. Yeah. 
So the middle income countries like Ghana, as we heard today, I mean, they're really diversifying their financing and are decently successful in it, I think. And middle to high income countries obviously have much more access to capital markets. Also, we need to understand that the world is much richer today than it is 15 years ago. Yeah. Growth in developing countries has been very, very good, compared, certainly compared to high income countries, the EU or the United States. And that also means that these countries have much more access to their own resources. Domestic resource mobilization becomes much more important and also is much bigger than in the past. Maybe it hasn't gone up a lot as a percentage of GDP, but still, if your GDP has grown a lot, you have more resources to do things from your own financing of your own resources instead of that you have to, that you require a lot of ODA or other resources to come from abroad. Then also, of course, the MDGs were very different than the SDGs. The MDGs were very much focused on people, human capital building. The SDGs are basically all encompassing and universal. They focus on all the three dimensions of sustainability, economic, social, and environmental sustainability. So it's a much wider package that we have to look at. And that's, of course, also why many people are saying the financing of these goals will be much more expensive and much more difficult to pull together than for the MDGs, which were very much focused on, on human capital. And then last, basically, an observation, and it was very relevant for the MDGs, I think, as well, is that actually financing alone is not going to do the trick. Yeah, we need good policies, we need good institutions, and if we have those in place, then flexible and lots of financing will really help. But if we don't have good policies or institutions in place, then it's often good money going after bad policies and, bad, and we don't get the results that we want. But if, if we have good policies, good institutions, a lot of financing can really do the trick, can really bring you the results that are necessary. Now, as in preparation for the, the others conference, the multilateral development banks, including the IMF and actually also including the European investment banks, put their head together to pu put an approach or position paper together and to put that forward with solutions on how they think they can contribute to the financing for development of the SDGs uh, starting in 2016. Or, uh, now, on the one hand, you can say that what I'm going to tell you is maybe nothing new, but at the same time, multilateral development banks really are trying to put an effort together to make sure that they're going to raise more financing in these various areas or help countries raise more financing in the areas necessary to implement and finance the SDGs. First, we're focusing on domestic resource mobilization. As I said already, when countries get richer, actually we see that the tax to GDP elasticity is bigger than one in many countries. So if countries get richer, actually tax revenues increases even faster than GDP does. So they're getting more resources themselves. And it's very important, I think, that we look at where countries are on domestic resource mobilization and that we try to provide them with the capacities to increase these revenues. Well, of course, there will always be trade-offs because many people will also tell you if you have too many, too, too high taxation, you're not necessarily getting the growth or it might uh, obstruct growth. But I think in many developing countries, we're not there yet. Other issue here also in domestic resource mobilization is really to handle the illicit transfers that are taking place. These are large, these are huge, and we need to get a handle of them. Other thing is on ODA, official development assistance. We need to use this smarter. We need to leverage the resources more to make sure that we can get more financing into a country to help with the investment projects necessary to make progress. And the other thing we're pr focusing on is really on leveraging and bringing private resources. This is really how to entice the private sector to finance development. So that's what we'll be trying to focus on as well. Now, how do you do some of that? Partly, I think we, we, we heard the minister also talking about you need to have bankable projects. Yeah. So it will become more and more important on the one side of, the, of the, the countries to prepare bankable projects that one can actually use international <laughs> private resources for. But at the same time, there's also the need that we are able to get the developed countries to bring these resources or these private resources to the developing countries. And here it's really also we need to look at what type of regulations do countries have in place and do they actually allow for their institutional investors to go abroad and invest in, uh, in, in developing countries. And this has a lot to do also with what the minister also mentioned is about risk management. What can multilateral development banks do? They can actually come with risk guarantees, they can help with the building of these bankable pro or the preparation of these uh, bankable projects to make sure that actually the private sector is willing to come in and seize opportunities 
uh, in the developing countries to provide the resources there. Now, I will jump over a few things, but there are, of course, issues around global public goods, or actually more global public bets sometimes. These are the issues around climate change. These are issues around pandemics. I don't have to talk here on the western side of Africa about the Ebola crisis. This is one of them. These are public bets where basically, you know, the, the, it, it, it goes, uh, the, 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 the things go across the border. Okay, let me quickly close with a few remarks on what the World Bank has done or is doing to position itself to implement and finance the SDGs. First, we, the bank in the last few years has, has changed, have actually put forward a strategy where which is, is focusing on ending of poverty and sharing prosperity, which actually meshes quite well with the SDGs, or actually they are an integral part basically of the sustainable development goals. At the same time, we also have adjusted our structure of the bank to be more directly, well, uh, in advance, maybe we didn't know that it would nicely link up with the SDGs, but in the end, it turns out, not to, my, to my extent, not surprising, because if you are good development thinkers, you come up with the same issues that other development thinkers come up with that are important for moving forward. So our structure now of the, what we call global practices, and we have 14 of them, I won't mention all of them, we have cross-cutting solution areas, but they actually nicely matches with the, with the sustainable development goals. So on that side, on the structure and on our focus, we are very ready to go forward with the, the SDGs. And then, of course, partly we're talking here about finance. What has the bank done to improve its leverage or to improve its financial resources going forward? First, we have looked at what we call margins to maneuver. We have very carefully taken a look at our balance sheet. And we think that through that carefully looking at how we spend our money and how we are organizing our balance sheet, we can increase resources over the next few years of close to $100 billion. The other issue, and I think this was very nicely mentioned by the minister, is the issue of IDA graduation. The bank has basically at the moment two windows. One is our concessional window, that is IDA, the International Development Association, and we have the commercial, more commercial-based window, which is IBRD. And we have seen, like I said, countries became richer, so many countries are graduating out of IDA, and they're falling in between concessional financing and non-concessional financing. So the bank is carefully looking at what it can do for these countries that are graduating. And there are at the moment discussions in the bank to put forward ideas that would allow a sort of an IDA plus by which countries like Ghana and other countries that have just graduated still get access to some type of concessional, non-concessional or blended financing. And this should provide another 35 billion. At the same time, we have very much worked on the growth of IFC. IFC is our private part of the World Bank Group, which directly invests in, uh, in private business. And at the same time, we're still going through a rather tough exercise internally to cut our administrative budgets in such a way that we can provide even more resources to developing countries. This, again, should provide a $400 million a year, yeah, compared to the $100 million billion out of our uh, changing of the way that we look at the balance sheet. Of course, this might be relatively peanuts, but if we can provide $400 million annually to developing countries again, then I think this will help. I'm, I'm at the same to time, bring you to close. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to enclose. Um, we also, we have put new initiatives forward by which we try to leverage private sector resources. One of them is the global infrastructure facility, by which we are asking institutional investors to put money in, and which we then manage to invest in infrastructure in, uh, in developing countries. And the other one is an initiative out of IFC, which is our asset it's called the Asset Managed Corporation, by which, in a sense, we get institutional investors like sovereign wealth funds and others to put money in, and that get directly invested, but in this case in development, but in development of private sector in, uh, in developing countries. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I suppose you promised to take 10 minutes, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> we should congratulate you on keeping to your time. I'm going to pass to sort of Manuel in a minute, if that's right, just following my, my list down, but I can see some sort of um, themes emerging as well. I mean, I, th I, think I expect we'll want to come back a little bit more to the nature of this sort of joint position from some of the MDBs, which I think is a really interesting development over the last month or so and what, what's emerging there. But equally, in terms of the, this sort of notion that DRM is domestic resource mobilization is critically important but may not be sufficient for certain, particularly for certain countries, um, and thus the residual importance of international public finance, but for what? And the, the role of leveraging and catalyzing other flows is something that I think is is much discussed if there is a finite resource, then what the, the primary focus of that should be. And I suspect we'll, we'll move towards a little bit what that might look like as a sort of set of statements in an outcome um, document will be an interesting, interesting piece of the picture. Also on the, um, on the other side of the picture, the issue around bankable projects and what can be done to actually facilitate that, that process. 
Um, let me pass on to Fadwell and then Sherry and then Philip and we'll, we'll try and wrap this up. I'll, um, I've been a little bit sort of unfair. I'm probably going to become tighter on time as we go along um, just because to so compensate for my own poor timekeeping in the beginning. But please, Fanwell, over to you. Five minutes would be great. Uh, thank you. Um, when, when I was growing up, we used to play football on the road. So we'd put two stones that go as goalposts instead of the goalposts. But usually what used to happen is if you were failing to score, you would make sure that when you get to that goal, you move the stone so that the goal is wider so that you can score. And the other team would do the same. So the goalkeeper would always move the, the stones closer so that the other team doesn't score. Um, and this is what I think about when we talk about MDGs, SDGs. We don't meet them, squeeze the goal, call them SDG, uh, expand the goal. Sometimes I think we are going in circles around this. Um, <coughs> however, I think it's important to realize that this future that we talk about is... I work in debt, actually. So I look at it in terms of we have borrowed this country, we have borrowed this world from our children who are not yet born. And therefore, we need to repay whatever we are using now for their benefit. And in the areas that we've been working in, I think there are five areas in which I believe that we can achieve these things. <coughs> Most of us talk about domestic resource mobilization, which I agree is extremely important. And that's the only source that can give us leverage to actually make use of our development goals. However, <coughs> there are issues around that. The more you think about it, the more you turn your head around and say, what does this mean? Everyone that I meet tells me Africa, for example, is the richest continent in terms of wealth. And yet, the most poor people are in the continent. For me, it doesn't matter whether you describe Africa as the richest or the poorest. If its citizens are poor, then the wealth is useless because the whole purpose of having a wealth is for the benefit of the people. We can go about and say we are not a poor country, we are not a poor nation, we are not a poor continent, but if people are still dying, if children are still dying, from preventable diseases on this continent, then we are poor. A few weeks ago, the Tabo Mbeki report gave us a very interesting insight into how much this continent is losing. And I think it's high time we started focusing on solving illicit financial flows. We need to be serious about <coughs> combating tax evasion and tax avoidance. It is incomprehensible in this day and age that we are relying on OECD to actually determine the rules and regulations of tax avoidance, and yet they are not the ones who are losing most of these IFFs. The world is so imbalanced, and I think we need to deal with that. The second element is international trade. Trade has been the source of development from time immemorial. Over the years, We've liberalized trade. We've created rules and policies through tax treaties, through bilateral trade investments that have made some of the poorest countries still vulnerable. And if we don't address the rules that govern trade, we will not solve the problems of the developing countries. <coughs> Foreign direct investment. <coughs> Foreign direct investment is very important for the development of the continent and the world. I sometimes question myself whether we are serious in our business of trying to compete with each other in terms of offering tax incentives. I sometimes call them subsidies to foreign companies. Because in reality, you are... I mean, when you offer, and this is to all my, my fellow ministers from Africa here, when you offer a tax incentive, just realize that you are actually passing on the right to tax to another country. Because this incentive that you've given to this particular company is going to be declared as profit wherever the company comes from. And the government in that particular company country will actually tax that profit. So a tax incentive in a way is just passing on your right to tax to an already developed country. And I think we need to be very careful when we actually compete in terms of tax incentives. Another area that's very important for me 
is <coughs> the area of ODA. ODA is still the most important source of development for some of the countries on the continent of Africa and in other parts of the world. There are others that are naturally rich in resources, but there are others that are not, and they will still rely on ODA. But we need to do something about ODA. ODA is still tied. Most of the countries haven't made their promises. We moved from Montreux, Paris, Ghana, Busan. I don't know where next. We will still not meet the commitments. Reminds me of this, the same story. If you can't score, change the goals, and then you don't have to have a problem. And I think we seem to be going through those circles most of the times. I <coughs> also want to say something about external debt. We can borrow to develop. But what has happened over time, I think we heard it here from the finance minister of Ghana. Three years ago, everyone was talking about Ghana and Zambia. Now Ghana has gone back to the IMF. They issued a bond. The money came. There was fung fungibility of money. If our leaders do not put the investments from all this debt in the right areas, we will come back and borrow. We will go back to the IMF and be rescued. It is extremely important that when you think about financing for the future, we actually decide as countries where we want to put our investment. This continent still needs big infrastructure projects. And that's why I worry more about the term leveraging private investment. I grew up with my mother who was selling beans, and she told me that any business person will only invest if what they put in is less than what they will get out. And that's the basic definition of private sector. I know they can play a role in terms of development, but remember, their primary focus is to get more than they put in. Let us have no illusions. So if we leverage that, we need to have mechanisms that ensure that they do not end up taking more that includes what we already had. And that is extremely important for us. These PPs uh, blending has to have rules and conditions that actually help us do that. Finally, it is important for us to realize that <coughs> when you talk about development, it is about the people. It is about the most vulnerable. It is about those children I saw in Liberia during the Ebola crisis who had nowhere to go when the only hospital in Monrovia, JF Kennedy, was closed. And if you look at it, Liberia is not that poor. And yet, the social and health infrastructure was devastated. But Li Liberia was still repaying its debt. It's important to remember that. So for us, what we say is that debt management is important, domestic revenue is important, international trade is important, let's fall on the rules, and private financial flows are important. However, remember that the profit-making objective of businesses hasn't changed. We saw that in 2008 when the financial crisis hit. Where did they turn to? public sector money, bailed them out, they are now into profit. Let's not leave that illusion again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I was going to applaud as well. There was about six there, so that was, that was really good from my perspective. Ch checking the microphone. Oh, good, I think. We have one that works, so we'll focus on that. Um, I think this is sort of starting to narrow down. I know we're, we're going to sort of move this um, much more sort of radically into the space of, of relentless into the, the international public finance world. But I think the, the diversity of sources is coming through very strongly, but also some emerging thinking on holding the line of some of those long-standing commitments associated with ODA um, that haven't yet been delivered on, and this rather thorny question about the nature of blending and leveraging. And I think we'll, we'll push in a minute to what sort of language and what sort of commitments we'll think about um, when we come to the... Um, the FFD outcome document and what might be appropriate given some debt sustainability. But let me, let me sort of proceed along the panel. Um, Sherry, you've been waiting incredibly patiently, thank you. And I feel rather unchivalrous making you wait so long, but let me give you opportunity now. <laughs> thank you so much and thanks for inviting me. Um, don't feel unchivalrous for having me wait, it's fine. The only problem is that I'm going to take things back a step and instead of narrowing down an ODA, 
I'm probably going to go back to the wider, wider perspective for a second. So I work in the Financing for Development Office in UNDESA, and we're working with the co-facilitators on the outcome document for the FFD process. And I first just want to give a quick overview of what's, um, where the process is. So as most of you know, there were substantive dialogues in the fall, and those were inputs into an elements paper from the co-facilitators. That was the basis of the first negotiating sessions, which were in January. On the basis of um, reactions to that and discussions in the first negotiating sessions, the outcome document has been prepared and is being distributed, um, made available today. So that's, the, um, that's where we are. And at the same time, there have been, um, we're in the process of starting the regional dialogues. So there was one in Santiago last week, and there's one in, um, in ECA next week in Addis Ababa. And there also will be ones in Jordan, in, um, in Asia, in Jakarta, and in ECE for Europe. So all of these are going to be inputs into the final discussion. Um, the IMF World Bank meetings will also be. The next they follow the, the next negotiating session, which is in April, and immediately following that, there'll be two, there's the um, meeting with the, in, in ECOSOC that follows up on the IMF World Bank meeting in ECOSOC with the World Bank, the IMF, and the WTO. And then following that, there's the means of implementation discussion for the post-2015 development agenda, which is going to be a discussion of, a joint discussion of financing for development and MOI. So there's a lot coming up that goes into the final outcome document. Oh, and, I've, and I, one, one, one more comment is that in right before that, we also have the business sector and civil society that each have days, and also days of presenting their positions, as well as this year we're going to have a day where sub-national governments also for municipal financing um, and subnational financing also have a day to discuss their position. So this is sort of this big process leading us to Addis in July. Um, that being said, I just want to talk about what is the possible outcomes from Addis. And in general, we're saying that there are three outcomes. One is the new framework, the updated framework, which I'll talk about in a second. The second are concrete deliverables. And the third is the follow-up process. And so I want to talk to talk about the, the framework. I want to take a step back for one second. And given five minutes, this is all very difficult to cover a huge amount of information. In fact, this is the biggest challenge, both for the outcome document as well as for this discussion, that this agenda is so broad and so detailed and so complex that how do you narrow this down into a five-minute presentation or into a short outcome document? So expect it to be long, a long outcome document. <laughs> Just a warning. <laughs> um, so the, the first thing is looking at the Monterey Consensus. As you know, there are seven chapters, um, um, six chapters. So domestic resource mobilization, um, international private finance, um, trade, international cooperation, including ODA, um, debt, and, and systemic issues. And most of those have been, except for systemic issues, have been discussed already to some extent. Um, the, the one thing to think about in terms of Monterey was that most of the, the debt chapter, for example, is external debt. And the private finance is, um, is external private finance. So you have one chapter on domestic resources, but the rest was really looking at things from this external perspective, from a balance of payments perspective. And that made a lot of sense at the time, given that we had been coming out of a lot of balance of payments crises. The new agenda is going beyond that and is really looking at, it's not necessarily so focused on the external side, it's really focused on the domestic side within the external environment. And so the result of that is that you'll see that some of the chapters, the titles are being changed from a focus of the external flows to the focus on where is investment going, where does that investment come from, and how do we use it to develop um, countries um, and, and use it to for, s for global sustainable development. And I bring that up, an interesting thing Joe was talking when he was talking about the flows, and he talked about the size of remittances. One of the other big lessons, one of the first big lessons, I think, since Monterey is, at the time of Monterey, there was a view that money was fungible, and it didn't matter where it was coming from. And I think now there's a much more nuanced understanding that different types of financing flows have different roles. And public finance is extremely different than private finance, is extremely different than remittances. So remittances are nor or have grown substantially, but they are private flows for private households, and we can't compare them or think of them versus ODA because ODA is public finance and is a very and public concessional finance, and is a very different animal. So that's one of the first places we go in terms of the new structure of the agenda. 
so what are the main challenges? And I think Joe's did a good job of bringing those out. The biggest one, from our perspective, is that in addition to Monterey was really a question of how do you finance development, particularly in developing countries. And um, the MDGs, Monterey came after the MDGs, and in a sense was a response to the MDGs as well. Because the MDGs are targets, our goals, our numbers. But what really gets you to, to achieving those is development. And that's something else. That's not a goal-based issue. That's a development policy, a development framework. What is the development, the underlying development strategy? Which brings the importance of national development strategies, or now national sustainable development strategies, that need to operate within the greater international context. And so the deal, so to speak, in Monterey was that each country is responsible for its own development, which at the time meant social and economic development. And the international community is responsible for enabling environment that allows countries to implement po development policies to grow. And that's why you went away from just goals to this broader holistic approach of, of development. And so that's, that's where we started. Now, where are the challenges that were coming in? And how much have I spent already? Because I haven't even started. So. <laughs> Um, so, okay. Okay, three minutes, oh my gosh, okay. So uh, I'm not going to get into, go into any of the details, but the, um, the, the, the first issue is bringing in the environmental side, right? So we're bringing in sustainable development in its three dimensions. The second big change, the second big challenge is that we're bringing in the universal element of the, of the post-2015 development agenda. So moving from Monterey, which was really a north-south agenda, to this universal agenda. And these are two of the big challenges we have to face. And the result is that um, in each of the different chapters, there are big challenges and th that have been mentioned here and big changes that have been mentioned. I think some of the ones I just want to point out very quickly, in domestic public, for example, the, que the questions of international cooperation for tax taxes is really important. In private, there's been a lot of lessons that have been learned. Because in Monterey, there was a perspective that the enabling environment, the domestic enabling environment, was the, most, was, the, was the main factor to bring private flows to developing countries. And we've learned since Monterey that while the domestic enabling environment, rule of law, um, institutions, et cetera, is crucial, it's not sufficient. Because countries, a lot of countries have made enormous progress in building their in, in domestic enabling environments and yet not sufficient money came and didn't go, certainly didn't go to the areas needed. In fact, some of that money became, was very volatile, short-term oriented and left during the crisis. So the one lesson is <coughs> that in terms of private flows, we need to have a better understanding of incentives and a better understanding of the incentives and the underlying structure of the private sector. And so when we talk about the private sector, what we're really talking about is public policy. From our perspective, what is public policy to make the private sector as contribute as much as possible in a sustainable and stable way to global objectives? How do we better align private incentives with public goals? And so that's one of the other big, the big lessons. Unfortunately, we don't have time to go through each of the different areas, and a lot of them have been discussed um, by the other members of the panel. Um, so I'm just going to go quickly to the second piece of this, which is that we're taking, Monterey looked at the sources of flows within the domestic enabling environment and the international enabling environment, including a stable international financial system. And now we're looking as well as wh what are the uses? Because we're trying to bring two agendas together. We're bringing the Monterey agenda that looks at the sources with the post-2015 development agenda, which is look, including the SDGs, which is looking at how is that money used? And so one of the challenges for us and for the, po for the outcome document is how do you bring these two different perspectives into one, into one um, framework and into one issue? And so I'd say that, the so just really quickly, that when you look at the SDGs, the first point is that there are enormous synergies across them. So that implementing one leads to implementation of another, which is one of the reasons so it's so difficult to cost these because of the enormous synergies between them. Nonetheless, you can think, you, there are several different categories. I'm not going to, you don't want to um, break it down into c concrete categories because of the synergies, but still we have the unfinished agenda of the MDGs is one sort of thing. So the so basic social needs. The second is this infrastructure or um, structural transformation, investments in structural transformation. A third is the jobs and sustainable growth. 
the si just the sustainable growth agenda, and the final is protecting our ecosystems and the environment. And all of these different types of ed ed all of these different SDGs require different types combinations of the different seven chapters in Monterey. I, I, I forgot to add that the new agenda is also including technology because of the importance of technology in the agenda. And so the each one of these has different combinations and different ways of bringing these different elements together to create, to reach our goals. And so very quickly, for example, in social, the social area, it's mostly public finance. And it's mostly domestic public supplemented by international concessional financing and ODA in particular. On the other, but there's also in some countries room for private finance. On the other hand, something like infrastructure really brings in both public and private in different roles and really looks for this sort of blending questions and all of these issues that are, that are being discussed. Um, so the, the point um, of this is that, um, that each of these areas, in a sense, is really an area where we can begin to think about deliverables. So for example, in social, um, the social area needs, there are discussions that have been dis brought forward of the idea of a compact between governments and their people for, for, for both a basic social safety net as well as for basic social needs. And so that's the first idea of, of a possible deliverable that could come out of this. And for countries that don't have the financing, where is the money going to come from? There are discussions of, well, the international community has to commit to help to, to countries that don't have that financing. The second area of infrastructure, there are, there's a lot going on. So just mentioned a couple of the, the World Bank new infrastructure platform. There are private infrastructure platforms that are coming together. There are new development banks that are happening. And so there are a lot of new exciting things happening. And one of the questions is there's the G20 has a new infrastructure hub. And one of the big questions is, how do you bring all of this together? And how do you, how do you get through, through a place where in five years from now, we don't run into two types of problems, which uh, you can imagine. Because there's so there, you can imagine that there's going to be a lot of money going to infrastructure in the next 15 years. But you could also imagine a case where that money goes to five countries and three sectors. You can also imagine a case where there's a glut of infrastructure financing, including short-term investment, that when interest rates rise in the developed world, completely blows up and you end up with a crisis. I spent a 20 years in the private sector and I've lived through many such cases where there was a trendy area to invest in, everybody did, and then interest rates rose, investment perspectives and risk, 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 risk um, appetite changed and the money left and there was a crisis. So there needs to be a focus on how do we think about bringing all of these new initiatives together and doing it in a long-term sustainable perspective? How do we make sure everybody is talking to each other? How do we ensure a global response that ensures that all of this great competition and great initiatives is going to work in a way that is long-term and sustainable? And so that brings me to my final point on the FFD process, which is the follow-up process. And the importance of constructing a follow-up process that's not duplicative of what else is happening, that respects everybody's um, mandates and the different roles. For example, I think that Joe's actually underspoke the role of the, world the multilateral development banks. It's not old, it's new. And the role of the multilateral development banks and regional and national development banks has an enormous role to play in this new agenda. But how do we do this in a way that ensures that first, no country is left behind, that no sectors are left behind, and that it's stable and long-term oriented. And we hope that the follow-up process to the FFD process can be a place where we bring groups together to, to make sure that things move forward in a way that is, is um, good for all countries. So thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm aware there is a tremendous amount of material to cover, and I appreciate you, you doing it um, so, so comprehensively. Actually, the, the segue is quite nice from your first point about the process, because um, what, what Philip can help us with a, a couple of points here is on the nature of the, the consultation process that happened in LAC and the um, UN ECLAC there and a couple of thoughts of what came out there and then we can move back into the, the substance. But also I think it's really helpful to have this framing of the, um, the sources dimension but also the uses and this sort of um, insight that different types of finance have different roles. I think that resonates quite strongly with the two, the two ministers' presentations about this, this much more strategic approach to what sort of finance is being applied to what sort of purposes with all the challenges inherent in that. I mean, it's not, it's not straightforward. Um, 
And um, let me just, and then I'll, what I'll do is get a couple of reflections, then I'm going to try and have it both ways, give you a chance to talk, but also get in a couple of questions from myself to mix it up. But anyway, Philip, um, over to you, please. Well, good morning, Ed, and to everyone. Um, I always ask myself the question when a moderator tells me I have five minutes, I ask the question, don't you know where I'm coming from? It's Latin America, and how is that possible uh, to do for us? Usually we take the five minutes to salute everyone since everyone else already has done so. I will start now talking about the regional consultation. Uh, and it starts of seeing the title that uh, was given at the regional consultations about order and the dilemma of middle-income countries. No other region in the world uh, has as many middle-income countries like Latin America and the Caribbean. Over 36% of the total of middle-income countries in the world come from our region. So we know something about the middle class because we believe we are the middle class or this is how they actually point us out of the world. But then let's go to the order. Order flows to our region are less than 8% of the total world's distribution. And it's reducing by the year. So I ask myself the next question, and this is not about Ed, it is more a question about the region. It is how can it come that we are the middle class of the world, but still 28%, this is over 167 million people live in poverty. And I believe that there we have a big question about inequality and how actually order flows are distributed uh, to what regions and what purposes as well. And we have this famous graduation process through GDP. This is nothing new actually, but it has not changed very much because the discussion is still on and we have not moved as far to see a multidimensional poverty measurement. And uh, we believe that this is a certain uh, certainty that uh, it was issued in the uh, regional consultation that we have to put this forward uh, in Addis Abeba. I believe also uh, there was the mention of the lack of the trust in the process until now. Monterey isn't really, when you talk about Monterey, you don't have a hype with politicians or development actors in the region. And I believe this lack of process, it's unfinished business, and especially a region that has been sidelined uh, by global development agendas, uh, is concerned of the trust of a new process, and we have to have this in mind. And there I go as well to the regional consensus. We are 33 states in Latin America and the Caribbean, and in many issues, unfortunately, and I mentioned that point as well in Santiago last week, we have 33 opinions about a lot of things, including FFT. Um, and I believe this is something we have to have in mind if we want to push forward uh, to Addis that we need regional consensus. Africa has shown us the way uh, in the post-2015 process where there is one regional perspective opposition towards post-2015 uh, which was agreed within the African Union. And I think it is a good example to take to the other regions that this is possible and we need to get regional consensus and momentum going uh, in order to be successful in Addis. And I believe the dynamics of private flows and challenges for uh, development is also an issue that was raised. It is volatile and it is asymmetric to actually the development that we are seeing in the region, and this is our concern which was raised. But also, we didn't only mention concerns, we also went forward and looked into innovative instruments and mechanisms on FFT, and specifically the region was very keen to talk about South-South cooperation and how South-South cooperation, not only within our region, but cross regions, specifically through Africa and Asia, um, that we see a lot of similarities within middle income countries where we cannot only learn, but we also can work together in order to have uh, a more um, transparent, effective process uh, and that our policies actually reach those uh, 
uh, that are most needed. And I believe there is a good reason why the four members of the higher level panel um, on post-2015 raised that question once and again, leave no one behind. If we are the champions of inequality, we need to be sure that we leave no one behind and that this job is actually made. And to comply with the SDGs, there has always been the talk about a paradigm shift. I'm all about a paradigm shift, but a paradigm shift needs political momentum and needs political backing. And this is something we have not seen at its fullest. And that's what we need to go towards these three key moments in Addis, New York, and Paris for this year. We need political momentum, we need political consensus, because if we want to make it right and leave no one behind, we actually have to get our act together and make and be accountable of what we do this year, 2015, which is, as you have said, a historical year, because it's the first time, I think, in humanity that we have the human resources, we have the technical resources, and also we have the economic resources to make this paradigm shift happening. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, We've got about um, so 20 minutes, and we'll take some questions. I mean, I, what I also appreciate about the final intervention is that it's um, bringing the sense of sort of politics in as well, which I think we want to get to as well. Um, I mean, one of the starting points that in the, the speeches was there's a, there's a risk of, um, of a lack of ambition, of an opportunity not being seized. And I think we want, what we want to inject is, you know, what are the stakes here? Um, what I propose to do is I'm going to sort of pose a question that I'm going to leave to you sort of think about while we get some other interventions, then I might come back to, which is, so looking forward to the outcome document with its sort of structure, I mean, let's say there's a section which will say something on the, the, the uses and purposes of international public finance. And what's the sort of content that we think is befitting a reasonable ambition, given where we are, that we want to be seeing? And or how do we raise the political stakes? What do we need to do to get that sort of in there? Where are the blockages? What we can do? So I, I'm going to sort of pose that so we end with a bit of something that, that raises those issues. But let me also catch a few other points and questions. Um, we'll take um, as many sort of brief comments as we can. If you want to make a comment, that's fine. If you have a question, I can't promise there'll be time to answer it, but we'll try and catch those during the conference. I think there are roving mics, as I understand it. Um, so if people want to raise hands, if you could just briefly say who you are, where you come from, and then a quick question. We'll take as many as we can in, in sort of um, a few minutes. We may have, I think there's got someone scratching their head. We, we may have resolved everything. It would be, uh, oh, sorry, Brett. Oh, sorry. Gentleman over there. Sorry, sir. Sorry, I was on your left hand side. So, and that, so it means you are right. Uh, I'm Luno Gelo, Luno Gelo from Tanzania, Economic and Social Research Foundation, ESRF, the core is a conference. And I think uh, uh, all the, the, the panelists. Uh, got it right that um, as we move towards post-2015, the issue of ensuring that uh, uh, inclusive growth, especially industrial development, is key. And I see that the uh, efforts to ensure that Africa uh, moves towards uh, industrial or development uh, will solve what I normally say uh, or in fertile Africa. Uh, I see a sterile Africa in terms of uh, ensuring that the external finance we get uh, generates some sustainable growth. At the moment, uh, without electricity, uh, without roads, uh, we, we see what I, I have been witnessing, that money comes to Africa, we borrow money, uh, for, for to construct a road, but actually most of that money goes back to Europe, goes back to America, because we have to buy everything used to use to, to, to build a road. So it doesn't help to sustain anything within Africa. If you FDI comes, 
put a, a hotel, uh, all the material, building material will come, will have to be uh, uh, imported. The experts to run the hotels, at least for the LSDC, the development, uh, least developed countries, we have that as a scenario. But now, if we have really um, enough energy, electricity, to have to set up our own uh, domestic industries, then at least there is that uh, coupling uh, of the external finance with the I industrial growth within the country, so within our country. So I, I see a, a bright future given the uh, the focus of the uh, the post 2015 uh, goals. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, there's a second hand. Um, there we are. Please take it back. Good morning. Uh, my name is Avery Thomas Moore, and I'm from the U.S., but I moved to Ghana a couple months ago to work with technology startups here. Um, and I was just curious about the role of local content and regional integration in including more companies and developing a local tax, tax base. Um, I just feel like transferring skills and having local participants and bringing more local capital into all of these projects is a fundamental solution for a lot of the issues we've seen thus far. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anyone else want to make an intervention? Yes, just the lady in the, in the pink top. Good morning. My name is Marie-Laura Kinrubade, and I head the African Development Bank office in Ghana. Um, thank you first to all the presenters. I think all the presentations were very much, very thought-provoking. I believe a number of issues that have been touched upon will have to depend to a large extent on each country and its capacity of each country to be very successful in implementing measures to en uh, um, uh, enhance domestic resource mobilization or creating the environment that is conducive for the private sector. But there is probably one issue that requires probably this whole cooperation at the international level and it has been touched upon by two of the presenters. It is the illicit transfer. And I would like to find out what would be a positive outcome of this whole consultation with respect to the issue of illicit transfer. There has been a lot of talk. I believe we know what needs to be done. So who needs to do what, when, how? Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm aware there's a blind spot on my left, so apologies if I'm not catching. The gentleman there with the hand raised. Yeah, just behind you, sir. Thank, uh, thank you very much. My name is Charles Ruangantale from Development Initiatives, Africa office in Nairobi. Uh, uh, a comment and uh, a small question. Uh, the, the comment is, uh, is about the, the issue of countries and people, um, and I think has, it has been reflected on a little bit. Uh, I would like uh, to hear a bit more about that. Um, we talk more about uh, middle-income countries, low-income countries, etc. cetera. Um, and of course, as development progresses, uh, we keep talking more about uh, those kinds of, uh, of issues. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we, we're beginning to see that in the same countries, uh, middle-income countries, there are lots of very poor people. So the question is, uh, in what ways can, uh, should, should we uh, be reflecting on a financing for future which takes care of uh, more people than just countries? Uh, I think that's the, uh, the question that uh, I'd like to uh, answer a bit more. Thank you. Just one, just in the front here. Let's get a microphone there, and I can take one or two more. If, if I'm not spotting you, and then gentlemen at the, the back in the blue afterwards, so I'll take a one, two. I'm not spotting you way more vigorously, and I can tell. My name is Juliet. My name is Juliet, Commonwealth Local Government Forum. Um, we are championing, Commonwealth Local Government Forum is championing the localization of the SDGs. We are talking here about people. And when we talk about people, we are saying that most people in Africa are, the, are very poor, vulnerable. I mean, across the board, I've heard them mention just those words that we use in trying to push for the localization of the SDGs. We are saying that, someone mentioned that uh, 
to finance development, especially the people, is the domestic revenue. We know for sure that the governments, the local governments do depend on government transfer because their own source revenue is almost insignificant. We know that the governments do have their priorities and to give the local government the funding that they're supposed to transfer, it's very difficult. I don't want to mention the countries because most African countries do have the same challenge when it comes to that. So what are we thinking about? How do we, and um, Shari just mentioned that, um, to, to, to fund uh, basic services, basic social net services, we have to depend on uh, domestic revenue and of course international funding to, to a certain extent. Um, he mentioned, he mentioned um, the political momentum, which is also important in this aspect. So what, how are we trying to look, about, look, at, look into this uh, funding of, uh, especially the social needs for the people, to develop the people. When we know that the local governments who are uh, supposed to, um, to bring about this development don't have the necessary funding you know, to support the poor or to provide these social amenities. So what can we do to make the local government stronger in that perspective so that they can be able to provide these social needs to the population so as to move them from that poverty stage? Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'll take a final question right <coughs> back. So I think I just fit in one. <coughs> Hello, I'm uh, Richard Carey, and I wear a number of hats, but I'm here working with the African Center for Economic Transformation at the moment. Uh, first, um, I have three points. First, the connection to the real economy. Finance finances the real economy. And here we have very dramatic demographic outlook. Uh, we will have two billion people more by 2050. So this period of the SDGs is taking us into that new kind of world. Now the labor force, uh, labor force growth will be in Africa, 300 million more in the labor force in Africa and in Southeast Asia about 400 million. And I'm wondering whether in the FFD process these demographic scenarios have been built in to financial scenarios and how the finance can be brought in to meet the opportunities of the labor force growth in Africa and in uh, Southeast Asia. Second point, we now have a G20. There was no G20 in Monterey. Why is the G20 important? Because it has brought into the agenda these very crucial questions of illicit flows, of infrastructure financing, of inclusive finance. And I think it would be really important for a positive interaction between the G20 and the UN outcome. Third point, nobody's mentioned this word yet, China. I mean, China has emerged as the most dynamic part of the global financing system. And we've seen very dramatic events with a new Asian infrastructure investment bank formed, the United Kingdom deciding to join that. So we're looking at a very important switch in the structure and politics of the multilateral financing system. And I hope very much over the next couple of days we can tease out what that uh, possibly means. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm afraid I won't be able to take this question, but I, I hope that we can pick it up in another session. I'm um, got about five minutes left. Um, I'm mindful that however much I offer the speakers for their final remarks, they'll take between two or three times more. But what I'm going to ask is the following. Um, if you could um, feel free to pick one point each that you'd like to pick up from the, the, the sort of the, the comments from the floor, but preferably no more. There were some, I think, some really useful points ranging from um, the role of the sort of uh, technology transfer, illicit transfer, uh, sorry, illicit flows, localization, um, sort of political mention of China, um, the sort of the, the politics there, which obviously are quite apparent over the last few days, um, countries, people, middle income countries. So one point there. And also this, this question that I'm quite interested in about sort of what, what success looks like, what we should be striving for, particularly in the IPF section of the report. What, what sort of content is, is sufficiently ambitious and what, what do we need to do politically, what needs to happen to unlock that? Um, if I could just maybe just take the same order in which um, presenters make their remarks. And so, um, Minister um, Kamora, if you wouldn't, wouldn't mind leading us off, thank you, sir. Thank you. I, I think 
one of the most important questions there is the nexus between country and, and people. I think we say we want to finance a future for all. It means we have to have um, a very clear uh, relationship between pursuing economic development, which requires significant financing, but that financing can be transformed into profitable financing, like building roads, energy. This could be self-financing, properly architectured, properly engineered. The other aspect is human development. Now, this is where you need soft financing. We have gone through various programs where simultaneously we're trying to pursue economic growth as well as human development. And in human development, I can tell you more than 40% of our budget is on, on uh, uh, social safety nets. But the critical issues there have to do with inequality. Whatever, however developed a country is in this world, there is still a stark concentration of poverty, of inequality, and of exclusiveness in, 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 in these people. And this is, these are three key areas. Inequality, gender inequality, we have the youth inequality. Even in the climate, there are those sectors of a country that suffer more in, in any climatic shock. Now, when it comes to health and education, these are, they need long-term, continuing investment. And this is where Ebola has taught us a lesson, that we ignored the health sector in the past, public health sector. Now, because it has shaken the whole world, everybody is using Ebola as a public good. And therefore, we need strong international cooperation uh, to work with, with, the, uh, with the countries that are affected to move uh, uh, ahead in, in treating uh, this virus. And I think that's very important. For the people, inclusiveness, local content, somebody mentioned local content. We have a local content framework that the people must be part of the development process. If you have a big company, an external company under uh, private foreign investment, let the people be the suppliers of some of the basic services. Let them open the tertiary uh, uh, um, enterprises around the investment area. Then they have a sense of belonging, a sense of ownership. That's the empowerment that the people would need. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes. I was thinking which question I will answer. There was a few easy ones and there's a few more difficult ones. And normally, you of course, always take the easy one and lift the difficult now ones. Now you've declared your hand. You have to ask the most challenging. <laughs> the, the which one? On China. Oh, on China, I think, I think was probably the most challenging one. I think in, in principle, I think the position of the World Bank is competition is good. So that's the short answer. I think the long answer, as long as that competition leads to better quality projects and better quality outcomes in development, we should all be happy. Um, other thing about the, the, the local content, or I think some of the questions were I really thought were very good, urbanization you know, how and, and rural development, how are we dealing that within a financing framework? I think we still really have to nail that. Uh, poverty in middle income countries, how are we gonna make sure that we don't, that we potentially still bring concessional resources to countries that are now middle income countries? I say we just have to think about India. I mean, 300 million of the extreme poor live in India by itself, and by, by now basically it's a middle income country, so it's almost graduating out of Ida. Um, and given that only 30 seconds, I leave it with that. Thank you. Uh, China <coughs> is a very interesting question. I have sat in meetings where I have been told several times how China is bad for Africa. I have sat in meetings where people have said, don't deal with China. And I ask myself a question. If you were as poor as African countries are, and you had the opportunity to have your hospital built in seven months, would you think about the human rights in China before the hospital in your country? I sometimes sympathize with the politicians who sit and make those decisions. But the key for me is, if you as a country decide on what type of leadership you need in terms of development, then you can get the best out of China, you can get the worst out of China. I'm bringing the point of that this continent needs strong leadership that takes the needs of the people up front, 
we still have leaders who are corrupt in this continent. Um, I hope there's no one from Zimbabwe here. I live in Zimbabwe, so I have to be careful when I get to the airport. Uh, <coughs> however, the point I'm making is that we need leadership that drives an agenda that is going to transform the continent. Whatever documents we sign, whatever agreements we make, as long as there is no leadership, as long as the leadership is looking at personal gain and not development, we will have as many beautiful documents as we have. We will have as many conferences as we have, and nothing is going to change. And I think the most important thing is leadership. And leadership is at different levels. And when that, the question of how do I want to see the future, I think when we shall have a future where under five children are not dying from preventable diseases, then we will use the phrase that Chinua Achebe used in Things for Apart. There is a statement that said, if an Iroko lizard jumped from the top of the tree to the ground and no one praised it, it was going to praise itself. And we are going to praise ourselves if we are going to save lives of mothers, children, the vulnerable, the disabled, in 15 years' time, that there's no one left behind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll very quickly um, mention something on the one of the biggest challenges and one of the places where hopefully there can be something coming out of the Addis Agreement would be on the issue of concessionality of finance, particularly when you go from a low-income country to middle and lower middle income country. That's really come up today in the discussions. And here it's really something where we can challenge the multilateral development banks to think about a new frame for concessionality. The expert committee report on sustainable development financing offered one suggestion of thinking about graduation, different levels of concessionality depending on the country, the development, vulnerability, as well as the type of project being financed. But we need to have some, some ways of thinking about how to deal with this pro problem of graduation. And it's interesting because the minister this morning mentioned um, borrowing on capital markets and how he was using that financing to um, replace short-term treasury bills, and that's very important. Of course, there is also the transfer of risk from short-term risk to currency risk. Depending on, your cap but depending on what you're exporting, you now have a dollar risk, and if your currency devalues, your debt levels are going to go higher which is one of the causes of debt crises. And so another challenge is really to, again, to the development banks, to think about lending more in local currencies, long-term in local currencies in countries. I know that it's started, but it can be done more. And there are ways to do it more by managing the portfolio of currency loans in a different ways. And these are things that um, you know, we c challenge the development banks to think of, to bring to the agenda, because they can really make an enormous difference. Thank you. Well, I want to get back to the question that was raised about local um, actors and their involvement into this process. I believe it is good news what we heard today that there is going uh, to be consultations with local governments, uh, but I also believe there is a necessity of a restructuring of the governments because just bringing them in into a consultative process, it's not enough. Uh, we, when we see, for example, in our region that over 80% of the population lives in uh, urban areas, we have a big challenge ahead of us, but we also have a big challenge of how do we govern uh, or how do we actually have a governance structure that only not only brings them in, but gives them a voice and a vote into this process. I know this is a big challenge, uh, but this is something we have to look into when we talk about a population that is growing into 2 billion by 2050, uh, that we have to tackle this right now and not uh, by the year 2050. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, this has been a fantastic scene setter. Um, I think we were probably a little ambitious in thinking we'd narrow. In fact, it was probably quite appropriate that it was broad. We've covered process, we've covered substance, we've covered the whole gamut of flows. And I think we've had some really valuable perspectives. Um, some sort of takeaways um, to talk about. The, a lot of reference to diversification, the diversification of, of sources and uses and the need to think about appropriate sort of complementary uses of that and I think from the from the two ministers the sense of the country strategy side. Um, second this helpful framing of uses and purposes and the, the social side, the infrastructure side, um, the notion of sort of competition coming in as well was interesting. Um, 
third, just um, very much from those concluding remarks, the access to concessional borrowing, the sort of the access to finance, the transitions into less concessional flows, the relationship with MDB reform, the politics of AIIB and other actors. Um, the other side of that, on the, the existence of um, bankable investments, shovel-ready projects, ready to go, how much of there is, is there that, that can actually accommodate this sort of um, less concessional finance. And finally, this whole question of um, leverage, um, the debt issues, the sustainability, the risks attendant to that. So I think there's some really chunky issues emerging that we can grapple with. I would, um, and layering, of course, all of this, the inequality point that came up quite strongly as well, and how we think about not just these sort of targets of hitting um, levels, but, but also that they reach, that reach the most vulnerable groups and that are, that are equal as well. Please join me in thanking our panel, Dr. Kamara, Jos Verbeck, Van Wabakosi, Shari Spiegel, Philip Schonrock. Please, if we can keep the coffee break as slick as possible, um, I suppose if I say five minutes, we might make 15 minutes, but something like that. We've got a fantastic panel um, coming up, as you'll see. Amadou Sai chairing Susan Fine, Jose Amo Tafu, um, Romilly Greenhill, Paul Steele, Leslie Nelson. Please, back in time for that. We will absolutely make sure that points you've raised are picked up. Some of the other issues raised by the panelists are captured. Um, and look forward to continuing the discussion over coffee for, for no more than 10 minutes. Ah, and there's something happening at the back, apparently. Do I need to? No, 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 no. That's the book. All will be revealed. There are drawings emerging on the wall. Um, come back and find out more um, well, after coffee. Anyway, thanks so much. Coffee back in 10 minutes, please.